Um, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us, partners, friends, to those on watching online. Uh, we appreciate you being here, tuning in. I use the term friends because I think if you're here um, or you're dialed in at home, uh, you're showing an interest in this topic, you're wanting to learn, you're keeping an open mind, um, sort of suspending some of your preconceived notions. Um, but, but not a blank slate. You bring your own opinions and experiences. And so uh, I think on whether it be through social media or the conversations happening up here, it is a conversation, and that was by design for this event. And so uh, just look forward to sharing this panel with you. Um, I'm Stacy Scholl. I'm a program associate with the Democracy Fund Voice, uh, which is one of the sponsors of today's events. And we have been a longtime partner with the EAC to bring, uh, to bring this event to you. And we're so pleased that we have uh, ASU, the Pastor Center, uh, joining in on this sort of a, a now a, a, a trifecta of, of folks involved. Um, I'm facilitating, facilitating the, the panel today on voluntary language assistance and other federal areas of coverage, including Section 208, which you've heard mentioned. This involves assistance from a voter's person of choice, and Section 40, uh, or 4E, which covers stateside Puerto Rican Americans. So we'll, we'll dive a little deeper into that topic as well. The end of 2016 brought updates to Section 203 coverage um, for language assistance, but the broader picture actually includes multi-directional demographic changes, um, including increases and decreases in counties across the country. So in one instance, um, Salt Lake County, which was covered under Section 203 uh, previously, is no longer covered. Um, uh, and it's speculated that's because English profic proficiency actually increased among their Spanish-speaking population. In contrast, my home state of Nebraska, that's a very small state, it's a flyover state, you might not might not have ever been there, um, is actually one of the largest refugee resettlement um, uh, areas per capita in the country, uh, but not enough to trigger language uh, protections under federal law. So when jurisdictions like these, uh, if they're not covered, provide assistance, it's certainly voluntary and um, it, it is appreciated. But the decision to provide assistance and what form it should take is not always clear or easy, and they often need partners to make this assistance meaningful. Additionally, as mentioned in previous panels, um, in all instances where a voter needs assistance, Section 208 is a safety net. Section 208 establishes that any voter who requires assistance to vote by reason of blindness, disability, or inability to read or write may be given assistance by a person of the voter's choice. Um, with some caveats. In creating this section, Congress uh, made it clear that they recognized that this type of assistance may actually be the only way that uh, a voter can have meaningful assistance. Today's panelists will help us understand then how that section can be operationalized um, to help voters with these accommodations. Lastly, we want to focus then on, on some of the particular challenges of, t of 2018 with Section um, 4E of the Voting Rights Act. And it's because of the tragic aftermath of Hurricane Maria um, and numerous uh, um, Puerto Rican Americans moving stateside to rebuild their lives. And that's, that's really key. It's a, it's a moment of welcome. It's a mo moment of um, inclusion. And we want to we really unpack what's happening there. Um, so Section 4E specifically prohibits the denial of voting rights of persons um, born in Puerto Rico on their ability to read, write, or understand English. So uh, I am not an expert in this area. I am learning alongside all of you. And so we've assembled a great group of experts for you today. So starting on my right, your left, we have Bill Cowles. He's a native Floridian and is the supervisor of elections in Orange County, Florida. He started in the elections office in 1989 um, as the chief deputy and was selected or elected supervisor in 1996 and has been reelected five times. Bill has also been a past appointee of the EAC Board of Advisors and Standards Board. He's the past president of IACRIOT, and I'll leave it to you all to look up the definition of <laughs> IACRIOT no longer exist, actually. Um, Bill, well, it exists, but in a different form. Uh, Bill has earned his bachelor's in public administration from the University of Central Florida, uh, and he's married with two sons and four grandsons. 
following that, uh, following Bill, you'll hear from Kira Romero Kraft. She's an associate counsel at Latino Justice um, Pearl Def, where she focuses on immigration rights, voting rights, criminal justice reform. And she began her legal career as an Equal Justice Works Fellow for Legal Aid Society of the Orange County Bar Association in, or in Orlando, Florida, where she focused on representing undocumented immigrant children. Prior to joining Latino Justice, she was the program director for the Children's Legal Program at Americans for Immigration Justice, where she led a team of lawyers um, representing immigrant children. Kira is the co-founder of the Advocacy Ch uh, Committee for the American Immigration Lawyers Association Central Florida Chapter, and she's a graduate of Rollins College and the Florida State University College of Law. To my left, your right, we have Francesca Menes. Uh, she's the state Florida State Coordinator for Local Progress, a national network of progressive local elected officials. Prior to joining Local Prog Progress for over 10 years, she led statewide voter engagement programs targeting black immigrant, Latinx, and new American voters. Francesca is the co-founder and steering committee member of the Black Immigration Network and serves on the Miami-Dade County Community Action Agency Executive Board in addition to a number of organizational boards. She's a graduate of Florida International University, earning her bachelor's in public science, uh, pu political science and women's studies with a minor in philosophy, and her master's is in public administration with a certificate in community develop development. Francesca is a first generation Haitian Dominican American and was raised in Miami's Little Haiti uh, community. And uh, we also are from, from the Sunshine State to the north, uh, Northeast, <laughs> we have Nicole Crispo. She's the city clerk for the city of Quincy, Massachusetts. She joined the city clerk's election department in 1999 and over the next 10 years advanced to the department's top super, uh, supervisory position earning her certification as a certified municipal clerk in 2011. She was appointed Quinc Quincy's assistant city clerk in 2014 and city clerk in 2016. Mrs. Crispo proudly serves as the chairwoman of the board of registrars, member of the license board, clerk of the city council, notary public, justice of the peace, as well as the city's shellfish warden. This past spring, Nicole is elected, <laughs> was elected vice president of the Massachusetts Clerks Association, and she and her husband of nearly 30 years, Jeff, uh, our lifelong Quincy residents and proud parents to a son. So uh, again, you'll notice we have a lot of representation from the Sunshine State, and so we will start there with Bill Cowles, um, and he's going to tell us uh, a little bit about Orange County's approach to language assistance, including serving um, displaced Puerto Ricans um, who are rebuilding their lives in Florida. So thank okay. you, Bill. Thank you, Stacy, and thank you to the three partners for having us uh, here today. Uh, I guess between putting together poll worker manuals and PowerPoints for poll worker training, I failed to do a PowerPoint for the day's presentation. Uh, so I'm your first presenter without one. But let me quickly just touch base about uh, Orange County, Florida's experience with uh, Section 203 and then to talk about the influx of Puerto Ricans to Central Florida. And you saw a statistic earlier showing roughly 16,000 additional Hispanic registrations uh, since the hurricane in, in our area. Uh, Orange County became part of the Section 203 in 1990, but it wasn't the state of Florida that actually fell under it until 2010, and that's kind of important to my uh, comments here. Uh, again, we have been doing everything bilingual in English and Spanish since 1990 in all of our materials. And everything was going great until the year 2000. Now, some of you think about the Florida election in terms of the presidency, but in actuality, several uh, voters in our county called the Department of Justice on us. And the issue was, it goes to a key part about the Section 203 is, is about the Hispanic language and dialect. Back then, we had questions on the ballot in that election, and so when the state of Florida had to put the questions out to the counties to put on the ballot, they took and sent the ballot language down to Miami-Dade County, asked Miami-Dade County to translate it, sent it back to the state, and the state then passed it on to each of us who were covered under Section 203 and had to provide uh, the questions in English and Spanish. And lo and behold, uh, that was when the complaint came in that we were using uh, Cuban language on our ballots and that our community was Puerto Rican. And how dare I put Cuban 
uh, translations. And so that then led uh, discussion with the Department of Justice. We wound up with a uh, consent decree, but it, it pointed out the issue that not only do you serve a language, but you also have to figure out the dialect for that area. And particularly in a state of Florida, as diverse as we are, uh, the language is um, very different. And so from that standpoint, Department of Justice came in, looked at our operations. They recognized that we had enough bilingual poll workers, but as we've heard today, they were not placed in the appropriate precincts. So we learned the process about how to uh, target precincts and to make sure that we had the staffing appropriate in those. And then we move forward, but I think the new issue in Florida, and particularly in my community, is now we're getting that separation between, okay, so we're doing things uh, that are perceived to be in Puerto Rican language, but what about the Haitian Creole community, a very fast growing segment of our community? And interestingly enough, uh, Haitian Creole is not a language that is covered by the United States Census. So it's not going to come on one of those letters from the Department of Justice. And so each of us are looking at how we best serve that area. Miami-Dade County Commissioners mandated Miami-Dade to do it. And then one other county, Broward County, Fort Lauderdale, is volunteering it. Uh, we're this year doing a composite uh, Creole translated ballot that will be in every polling place so a voter can use it as a way. But I think as we move into the 2020 census, the uh, issue with the Haitian Creole uh, is going to be a major topic. Uh, some of the things about our area, I think uh, we've talked about here today, make sure your office staff reflects the community in terms of uh, your structure. Uh, interesting enough, ours breaks down almost 33% white, 33% black, 33% uh, uh, Hispanic, and 1% other. Uh, our staff has developed to be the translator because they know the community and working with them. And so we move ahead to 2017 uh, when Hurricane Maria hit and we had the influx of uh, voters uh, from Puerto Rico. And again, I think as the secretary said at, during lunch is when they come, their major concern was housing, school, uh, and voting was not necessarily uh, there on the forefront. Uh, housing was a big one as well. So there was voter registration offered. And as things have changed with voter registration, voter registration now are so many third party voter registration groups that are camp out in our state full time. Uh, so they're actually out there doing a lot of the work. A lot of them went to the driver's license office to get their ID and then also at the same time uh, vote registered to voters. So we saw that what we had to do to support them uh, was not necessarily an increase in our work because we were already doing it uh, with the help of our partners like the third party voter registration groups. Uh, I think the thing that happens with the uh, influx with uh, Puerto Ricans is it also are some things for us that remember and one of them is right now FEMA is still paying for housing in hotels, uh, in motels in our area. And so that's changed us in how we have to do our street indexes because it's supposed to be on resident address and not commercial addresses. And so that's a, another area that we are uh, dealing with. And one interesting question that came up in our state association meeting, which is a, a change, is that uh, should the U.S. territories be encouraged to join the ERIC project because you have the transition of those who are voting in Puerto Rico who are then coming uh, to the states and registering to vote. And then the biggest question you get asked is how many have actually registered and that are new from Puerto Rico? And that's the hardest question to answer because many of them come from other states, go to other states and then come back to us. Uh, so that's a challenge that we're facing and the big question to be answered is how will they vote in this election uh, this five weeks from today uh, in Orange County and in the state of Florida. Thank you. Thank you. So my name is Kira Romero Kraft. I'm from Latino Justice Pearl Def. The Pearl Def stands for Puerto Rican Legal Defense and Education Fund. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you all to, uh, for being here today and for the organizers who have us here. Um, so I was asked to speak on Section 4E, which is the provision um, little known under the Voting Rights Act that provides 
that you uh, are you no jurisdiction should deny the right to vote to any Spanish speaking citizen from Puerto Rico. Um, so obviously, I, I do want to provide a little bit of context because I think it's important into the to the uh, young woman's question earlier about um, how the evacuees or the refugees, the Puerto Rican refugees, are faring in particular Central Florida, as Bill had mentioned, um, we have received the most, uh, the highest number of evacuees in Central Florida. In, in the state of Florida, but I would argue that Central Florida has probably received more than any other uh, part of the US. And so that presents some challenges in terms of the FEMA litigation, Latino justice along with um, a pro bono uh, partner, um, as well as a, a solo practitioner in Massachusetts still did file litigation against FEMA. Um, and the reason that that's important amongst a, a number of other reasons is because of these challenges that are presented from folks that are living in emergency shelter. Um, and, and so you ask, you know, how important it is, is it to vote? Well, obviously all of us are here because we recognize that it's extremely important. But to someone who has lost absolutely everything and on top of their community, um, that is, you know, it, it's probably the last thing on their mind um, when they're trying to recreate a life. Uh, and obviously in Central Florida, for all of you who haven't visited or don't know, we have a very large, well-established Puerto Rican community that has been for many, many years. So in terms of trying to figure out where you wanted to relocate to on the mainland, Central Florida seems like, you know, a, a good fit. Some of the problems, however, that we face in the state of Florida is very, is very little uh, public assistance um, in terms of housing, in terms of affordable housing, um, folks with issues uh, involving education, um, employment issues, and obviously the language issue. Um, so those are some of the things that we um, at Latino Justice are working through a coalition called Abrazo Boricua, a lot of civic engagement groups, uh, service-oriented groups that are reaching out to the Puerto Rican community, specifically the evacuee community, to provide services so that we can connect them with some of the uh, needs that they have, uh, but then also educate them on the differences that exist uh, in terms of voting on the mainland as opposed to on the island. And just to kind of give you an example, um, in Puerto Rico, you only need a uh, state electoral card or ID to vote, and most people do get that um, uh, very quickly, whereas you know Florida has extensive ID requirements in order to register to vote. Puerto Rico, we could learn a lot from Puerto Rico. Uh, voting is a holiday. So they have a, an extremely high percentage of turnout typically, um, and they vote every four years. They also are limited in terms of who th they vote for governor, they vote for um, these specific uh, positions, whereas in Florida, we have elections every year. And we vote for uh, the tax collector to school board members. Uh, I mean, it, it's judges, partisan and nonpartisan, closed primaries. So you add all of that, and you're faced with a very challenging landscape to try to interpret to someone who is a new arrival and is obviously you know, under all different types of stresses, as you can imagine, from, from losing, you know, in some cases, everything. Um, so, so those are some of the challenges that we face, but we're very fortunate to be connected with a lot of those third party organizations, a lot of the service community in the work that we're doing to engage uh, the Puerto Rican community. We have been specifically reaching out to certain supervisors of elections. Full disclosure, I am an Orange County voter. <laughs> um, but I've never met Bill, which is probably a good <laughs> sign. Um, uh, but there are um, some challenges because uh, we do have this idea or this sense, I think, and, and a lot of it, I think, has to do with engaging with the uh, civic groups and community organizations in that these voters are not in my jurisdiction. And so those are some of the challenges that we're facing. We're still continuing to work um, with the supervisor of elections and the different uh, community and civic groups um, in the different areas of the state. Uh, but I can tell you that the influx is real. There, there have been, I, I can't uh, give, maybe Francesca maybe has a better idea of the number, because there have been competing numbers that have been out there published in newspapers, published uh, by uh, different uh, uh, data analysis um, groups, uh, but, but it can range anywhere from 50,000 to 100,000. And remember that even before the hurricane, there was a fiscal crisis in Puerto Rico that you, there was a steady migration and influx of Puerto Ricans um, coming to the state of Florida. Uh, so, so that is um, uh, what we're seeing uh, in our state. Uh, and again, um, working very closely with the different uh, community organizations and the supervisor of elections. 
and also uh, trying to uh, present the information in a digestible form to our community is challenging. Uh, this fall, we will have 13 revisions to the Florida Constitution on the ballot. I can't uh, imagine how long that's going to be. And if anyone here speaks Spanish, uh, sometimes what you can say in English in three words takes seven or eight words in Spanish. Um, so the papeleta in Spanish is going to be pretty thick. Uh, and so we're, we're, you know, we're, we're looking forward to, to those uh, challenges that lay ahead, but we do need um, everyone on board and, and trying to reach out to the community again that is facing challenges uh, outside of, of voting in the state of Florida. Thank you. Thank you, Kira. And I see, Bill, you've had a little bit of a visual there. Um, if you want to share. <laughs> well, she asked about this year's ballot, but uh, the best one is the 2012 election in which we had uh, more questions than we are this year. But in Florida, the Florida legislature is allowed to take and exceed the 75 word limit. So when they do, and then in, in the 2012, every voter in Orange County got three ballots printed back to back. But the key thing is this one page here is question number four in English and Spanish, and it took up the whole page. <laughs> and I was sued in the past over the fact that there were more words in Spanish than there were in English, and I broke, you know, the law, but that failed. Well, thank you for that visual, which does actually cause a little bit of anxiety on my part, seeing that much text on a, on a page, but um, certainly important that we, we talk about this. So I want to pass it over then to Francesca, if you'll go ahead and oh, let yes. us uh, hear from you. Um, so I'm just going to speak, like, very briefly around um, Haitian voters um, in Miami-Dade County specifically. That's where I grew up. I grew up in the Little Haiti community. My mother and my father migrated here um, in the late 70s, and so, um, and both my parents are naturalized U.S. citizens. Um, so particularly in that household, having to kind of navigate my parents through ballots when I was young myself was a very interesting process, particularly when the county did not have Creole on the ballot. And so ultimately, in 1999, this is from our Miami-Dade County Code, um, Section 12-16, which is our current law, where um, the county commission actually did take a proactive step um, in acknowledging that the Haitian community was growing in Miami-Dade County and that they needed to actually um, figure out ways to encourage that community to um, turn out and vote. And so, but there were a lot of flaws in the, um, in the language, in particular that it was giving um, discretion to the SOE, to the supervisor of elections, to identify where those communities were. And that was relying heavily on the place of birth um, and relying on census data. And to rely on census data even up till this day where you're not able to identify yourself as a black immigrant meant that the data wasn't there. There was an undercount. So that means precincts that were gonna be targeted were not gonna be targeted in the ways that they needed to because our population wasn't showing up in the numbers that they needed to. Um, and that data ultimately was flawed. And so the precincts that we needed to have that recognition was not going to be there. Um, but they did have some good, um, you know, encouragement of the county setting aside resources for advertisement. So that meant um, in Haitian newspapers, and they made sure that it was very clear to say Haitian and not French because there's this classist, um, basically that exists in our community where those who are more educated speak French as opposed to those who overall Haitians speak Creole. And so being very clear that you are publishing in Haitian newspapers, um, Haitian radio, as opposed to French news outlets. Um, and so when you look at ultimately, even though in 1999 that you did have this language, when we got to the 2000 election, it came to head because you didn't have the proper training, you didn't have the proper notification, you didn't have the proper staffing. And so in the 2000 election, Haitians were actually being turned away. I don't know how I'd remember that because I wasn't even eligible to vote yet. Um, but um, yeah, and so ultimately, Haitians were being turned away in the ballot. And so this is when the DOJ actually stepped in. And the DOJ um, basically put pressure, filed a complaint um, with Miami-Dade County, which um, led to a consent order um, basically saying that 
the Miami-Dade County would modify their trainings um, for their poll workers. You would make sure, as Bill said, that the poll workers reflect the communities that they were in. Um, Miami-Dade County is a very siloed and very segregated county. So you have the Haitians that live in one area, you have um, Dominicans living in one area, Cubans living in one area, African Americans living in one area. So if you actually do the work, it's easy to identify where there's huge um, where there's a huge presence of the Haitian community. All you have to do is do the work. Um, there was employment of bilingual election employees um, and soliciting the assistance of local Haitian organizations. We had many of those organizations. You had that through the Catholic Church with the refugee resettlements, um, as well as the advertisement in Haitian radio. And so right now, now you have documents basically like that that says, Conte Miami-Dade Guide Information pour Voter, which is basically is the Miami-Dade's guide for voters. And so the, it's, bas it's about a 20-page document that's printed um, in Creole with the Voters, um, Voters Bill of Rights and um, is actually printed in three languages because that's ultimately what came out of 20, um, um, 2002 was that we now shifted to a trilingual ballot, um, English, Spanish, and Creole. So when you go to a voting booth, you'll see things um, like this, polling place, Vivo Vote um, in Creole, so trilingual. You'll also have the signs with the precincts that will be trilingual. Even the, um, the SOE, um, this was um, actually on Twitter um, during Haitian Flag Day um, on May 18th, where this is like encouraging voting, we're celebrating Haitian Flag Day. Um, and this is what our sample ballot looks like for August 2018. Bill mentioned around the, um, and Kara mentioned around the 13 constitutional amendments. Our biggest concern is that our ballot is going to be very, very long. And we're very, very concerned whether or not people are actually going to make it through the ballot because if you, um, this is just one page where everything, we, we don't run separate ballots for different languages. You have all three languages on one ballot. So that means constitutional amendments are going to run through. And in Miami-Dade, we're in our charter review process. So there's also going to be charter reviews. We have circuit court judges, county court judges, Florida um, Supreme Court judges, our ballot is going to be anticipated to be very, very long. And so how are people actually going to engage in the ballot is a very huge concern. And we'll probably get deeper into it in the questions because we definitely have a lot of concerns around for those who actually don't read Creole because there was a huge debate on whether or not Creole could be a written language and universities basically had to come together to actually write down, create an actual dictionary to show that um, Haitian Creole is just not a spoken language, but it can also be written. But what about those who can't actually read Creole? How are they actually consuming this information, being able to navigate themselves through um, the process, although they're able to bring someone with them to the polls um, if that person is not as as they should be as well. How are they also being guided through the process of reading um, the poll? So big ups to Miami-Dade for, you know, taking, you know, that step of like making sure everything is written down trilingually, but we still have to kind of figure out how is it also that we're disseminating information that is non-biased because we don't want to be seen that we're encouraging to be voting one way or another, but that the voters are getting as much information as they need. Thank you. And last, we'll hear from Nicole. Thank you. Yeah, I had to fight with it. Hello, and thank you for having me. The city here I am here to speak about is my hometown. It is the eighth largest city in Massachusetts. Our population is close to 100,000 and growing. It is a suburb of Boston, 13 miles south. We have a Plan A form of government and a strong mayor and a nine-member council. I have some fun facts to share with you about Quincy. We are the birthplace of Chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff, General Joseph Francis Dumford, Jr., as well as two U.S. presidents, John Adams and his son, John Quincy Adams. We are also proud of our city's many firsts, including the first commercial railroad known as the Granite Railway, I'm sorry, these uh, got a little messed up. How do you go forward? Oh, that one, thank you. I was pressing the wrong one.
Sorry. I have some fun facts to share. Oh, sorry, I already read that one. <laughs> Being a large city with small community values makes it critical to stay relevant with civil engagement. To reach all residents, we utilize all facets available, hoping to influence all our members of our community. The city of Quincy is made up of 13 neighborhoods. As you can see, I circled three where they have a large population of Asian nationality. Quincy has the highest per capita population in the state of Massachusetts. 2010 federal census provided that we meet a high standards needing to have a bilingual ballot, which has, has resulted in an abundance of participation of growth in our election over the last 10 years. To put Quincy's population into perspective, Asians are 24% of the Quincy's total population makeup, many of whom do not speak English or have limited English. Based upon two th 2016 presidential election, 42,000 people voted. This is 72% of Quincy's population. Of that 72%, 8,500 were Asian. This is equal to 20% of the total vote. A great part of our growth in voting is due to our partnership with various agencies. Both the Asian American Defense League and Education Fund and the Department of Justice. They are great monitors and tools for the Asian community, as well as an asset for feedback in our elections. In 2005, we started printing various election materials in English, Chinese, and Vietnamese. The translated materials were very well perceived by the community and citywide organizations. We also offer our website in many languages. Our Secretary of the Commonwealth first started to provide translated voter registrations in 2005. We both agree it's the first step for our residents to be active participants. Starts with the voter registration process. Confidence and ease in the process will ensure future and recurring participation within the community. Election day signage is crucial to guarantee a well-organized and efficient process in our election workers and voters alike. To meet the needs of our community, we provide signage in 31 languages, I'm sorry, in three languages instead of our required two. This is always distributed to our 31 precincts within Quincy. All the questions on the ballot are written in English and Chinese, in 2020 census will determine if any other languages will be introduced. Vincent Au is our full-time bilingual city clerk employee office. His duties include voter registration, census, election day support, outreach events, and other city office support. This can include marriage intentions, business license, licensing, and vital records. Staffing during election day is imperative. A well-structured group is needed to support all of our voters. Since the inception, I have found success in allocation based on composition of precinct demographics. It is important that we staff our bilingual police officers to support our election as community liaisons. Our key to success in Quincy is coming together as a community to serve all of our residents. I am proud to say that I have a community filled of active, vocal, and engaged members. I have a strong and helpful municipal support to help evolve my city as it continues to grow. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. 
Um, so I, I do want to actually, uh, I know we would open it, we're going to open it up to audience questions, but I have uh, a couple questions because I think there's such an interesting interplay here between those who have um, some real on the ground experience in Florida and then of course a, a community that's gone above and beyond uh, to, and I, I hear this, the, the community partnerships. And so uh, one of the things that I want to ask um, from our folks from Florida is we have, a, we have advocates here and then we have an official. And I, I think there's a really interesting dynamic then of what do, uh, first to Bill, what do you think is, is one thing that you wish advocates um, in your own community knew about your outreach efforts? Um, and if you could share a little bit about that and then I, I wanna ask our advocates some of the same questions. That's a good question because I think we're so intertwined uh, that we, uh, sometimes are competing to do the same thing. Uh, so we work together on scheduling uh, in our outreach. I think the thing that is that we probably would wish that in the process that the third party voter registration groups are doing, they would take and do as much of the voter education of the election process that we do. And, you know, and I say from my experience of now 29 years, uh, before NVRA, uh, we took and we were able to have deputy volunteer registrars who we trained, who went out and had uh, documented uh, voter registration applications that we control. And they did not only, this is about registering, but obviously the key one is Florida is a closed primary state. And if you're not registered in that political party, you do not get to vote in the primary for those partisan uh, positions and that's something that you know is and I think it goes back to the comments is made both in the uh, Puerto Rican community and the Haitian community is they don't understand our political process and that's where the civic education is needed more and sometimes I wish that there be more on the civic education and less emphasis on the number of registrations and here I'd like to pose the same inverted question to you is uh, I've heard you talk about some of the relationships with uh, election, uh, local election officials. What is one thing that you wish you could communicate to them ahead of this election cycle that you think will be key for uh, Puerto Rican American enfranchisement? I think, uh, especially for the communities, I mean, in Orange County and other uh, jurisdictions where they've obviously have have undergone the changes in 1990, so they have a very well-oiled machine and they know how to operate within the state and where they get the different pieces. You know, they don't have line item budgets anymore. They no longer need them because they have such a huge bilingual staff that they, they also are able to get the translated documents that they need. Um, but what I would impart to the newer jurisdictions or those that are covered um, under 4E is that, or coverage really meaning that they have, they have Puerto Rican uh, voters in their jurisdiction, is that they really understand the importance of language access to the voters and that it's part of our history, but also uh, you know, it's, it's something that the folks that are needing it really need it. Uh, and without it, they are blind. They can't, they won't be able to um, you know, fully integrate into this voting system that they are now, you know, a member of. So that is, I guess, the, I, if, if I could invert it for them, I would say, you know, what if you, you know, do you speak German? If you went to Germany and now you find yourself as a citizen of that country, how would you feel if now you're being posed with this very important question? And again, for our community, as I think Bill or other folks have alluded to, you know, you vote for folks that are going to have an impact on the day to day. The school commissioner, the you know school board official. Um, I think the secretary of state also said that. Uh, and in Puerto Rico, where everything is uniform, they have one commission of elections that does it. You know, applies uniformly um, all of the standards for their elections. Obviously, it's very different. You're going to different counties. Folks manage things differently. Um, so that's what I would I would try to um, have them understand to put themselves in in their shoes. Um, and also that language access is is the support that the United States, I think, needs because being bilingual, trilingual is super important. We cannot close ourselves off. America is a player in the world. Our citizens reflect that. And I think to, to close that off uh, really shows 
uh, a change of thinking um, that I think needs to happen, but that's, that's a whole other conversation. But, but I think if, if people try to see it from that perspective, I think it you know, maybe will open their eyes to the importance and the need for it. Thank you. Uh, so Francesca, um, it, it, I'm mindful that for Haitian Creole voters, there might be a particular reliance on Section 208 given the, the speaking element of, of the language. What is one thing then that you would want to be sure to communicate to local election officials about their eye towards that need and helping this community? So I would, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier, it's um, figuring out a way, I don't even know if it's possible, but it's just to have the ballot like verbally, like recorded so that people can actually hear it because um, especially with Creole, when reading it, and the way that it's been officialized and um, written is that not everyone is going to understand what's actually being written because depending on where you're from, like my parents are from the mountains all the way out in the outskirts um, of Haiti. And so the way that they understand Creole, the way that they see Creole being written, they may not necessarily understand it when they get to the polls. And so if there's like a section um, or a part in the um, polling location where someone can actually have the paper in front of them, but also hearing it, uh, having someone record it, um, would be something that um, I highly recommend because um, having a poll worker there, and um, I know this is um, happens in a lot of communities, sometimes poll workers are planted people who are there for campaigns and who are there working for um, particular candidates. And so you can't 100% trust a poll worker to be able to interpret the ballot for someone. You can't 100% um, believe that they're going to be unbiased in the way that they're guiding someone to fill out the ballot. So unless that person is bringing a family member, you're not sure how is that person being assisted. And so if there's something that's actually, OK, there's just like how we have for our blind. You know, if there's somewhere that they can go to actually listen to it verbally before they co -cast, um, go cast their ballots is something that um, I would definitely encourage. And we would have to figure out time frame wise because I know in, in our Haitian community, our polls, um, even once they close at seven, you'll probably have a line until like 10 o'clock at night. And so um, that means, you know, being more flexible of having more polling locations. And um, because right now we have very few. And thankfully, I guess in Miami-Dade County, because in Florida, you have, I believe, what, up to eight days for early voting, but up to 14 days. And so thankfully for Miami-Dade County, we actually utilize all 14 days of early voting. And so um, whether that's advertisement um, encouraging people to actually utilize that 14 days, it's a 12-hour day that you have for 14 days, about two days before or two, three days before the elections to actually go out and vote, um, utilizing all of those different um, frames that you have to actually encourage people to turn out early and use this mechanism to encourage them and actually engage them in the voting process. Thank you for all of those points. Really appreciate it. And Nicole, so uh, you've expressed and have, have um, really shown us the great interconnectivity with uh, your office and uh, community groups and community organizations. Um, but even, even in the best of relationships, sometimes there can be some misunderstanding. Moving towards this, the actual election day, is there anything that you um, would want that group, this group of folks, to understand about your, your office's efforts um, and the work that you're doing for voters that you think would, would continue to keep that relationship really healthy? Well, we do work with, um, like I said, the Department of Justice and our secretary's office, and we're very proud of our um, Asian outreach. Um, I will say that just like they are intimidated. So if there is anything we can do, um, and especially with the census, and we're going to try to get that out in our uh, complete count committees, that it's OK to answer the census so that we are getting good numbers um, so that we can provide the materials needed to go forth in the process. Thank you, Nicole. So I will go ahead and open the floor to any questions from the audience. <laughs> Hi. 
Hi. Um, I am particularly intrigued by the ability to be to speak to someone who has worked with the Puerto Rican community in Florida uh, on getting people to vote. So I would love to hear from you. What are those best moves, best activities that you have to encourage people to vote? I mean, I think about a community in Rhode Island like Woonsocket, where we had about 7,000 Puerto Ricans move in and com getting people to register and to actually then getting them to the ballot box has been a really uphill struggle. So if there are any lessons learned about how to make that connection for people, I'd be very interested in it. Sure, so I'll be happy to share with anyone here if you're interested, you wanna bring this back home to communities, but I'm, I'm thrilled we have We've created some strong ties with our Massachusetts community of Puerto Ricans um, through, unfortunately, bad circumstances, but good connections uh, through the FEMA litigation. Uh, but we have one of our community partners created a pamphlet that talks about the differences voting in Puerto Rico and then voting in the United States, which I think is really helpful. We will shortly have a pamphlet that talks about 4E and what the requirements are um, in terms of being provided all election materials, ballots, everything in Spanish for anyone who's been educated in Puerto Rico. So um, we will have that and I'll be happy to share that with you. Now, the, the question about how to get Puerto Ricans to vote, that's, that's the big question, right? Uh, you know, we talked a little bit before coming on stage about uh, the political nature of, of uh, how we're seen in terms of the work we're doing. You cannot divorce what we're doing with, from politics, unfortunately. And, and I can say this from as a very young, new, fresh nonprofit lawyer, I thought, well, everybody's gonna love that I'm working for immigrant juveniles. And then I realized, hey, my board member hates this and we're not allowed to talk about it with, you know, and so you realize even though, you know, for us, uh, you working in the public interest as a lawyer working in the public interest, you think like, wow, everyone's gonna welcome it and support it. And in this highly politicized climate that we find ourselves in, you realize that that is, that, that, you know, that's not true. Um, so with Puerto Ricans, I mean, it, it's, it presents a very unique challenges. Again, Puerto Rico has these wonderful uh, 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 national pride in terms of voting, in terms of being very involved that we could really uh, implement in this country. Um, however, I think that the nationalistic aspect of it can also be an obstacle, as you alluded to, because folks don't necessarily see the connection of voting, even local or federal or state, and how that ties to the conditions on the island. So that's something that is a big voter education piece. But I think if we're able to make those connections, and that's something that we're very actively doing with the organizing communities, um, I think that's essential for folks because as a, as a territory of the United States, you know, Congress has full authority o over the island. So I think that that's something that is key to getting our Puerto Rican uh, uh, folks uh, voting. The other aspect of it is some folks do want to go back to the island. So they, they're not necessarily thinking, I want to create roots here. So they're thinking, well, I'm, I'm not really interested. I don't have time. So trying to get them to understand, you know, that this is an opportunity that is presented that, that is really um, unique uh, and that um, as U.S. citizens, it's, it's a privilege and we are happy to help them exert that, you know, opportunity to vote and to have their voices heard. Uh, and, and in the state of Florida, you know, it's not something that it has happened just locally or even on a statewide level nationally. Attention has been focused now on the Puerto Rican eva evacuees, the large number of folks that are now in our state. And it is really, I mean, quite shocking to see how folks are capitalizing on this and how certain folks, you know, are wanting um, uh, to use this as an opportunity to, to get their votes. Um, I mean, and that's just the nature of, of, of you know, voting in this country. And so uh, it's going to be very interesting to see how that all plays out during the midterm elections, during the, uh, the, the general election. But uh, I think that in terms of what we can do as community organizations, as advocates, as folks who work within the system, is really try to open up those channels of communication, uh, try to call other uh, uh, officials, supervisor of elections, folks that have experience doing this, to try to get the information. Because I think there are some easier ways, even in the cost-effective ways um, that were talked about the previous panel, I think those are things that people can implement. Um, but then at the same same token, I just saw a voter registration van <laughs> that we all had an idea and someone actually has done it from the organizing community. And I thought, wow, that's terrific because it, it presents that element that culturally I think people will associate like this is, this is something that I can recognize. 
um, and hopefully they can buy into in terms of where they find themselves now and having that opportunity and, and really the power that can be created by having people engaged and voting. So, so I, I just want to encourage you to whatever materials you do produce, mm -hmm. that you think about the National Association of Secretaries of State, the National Association of State Election Directors, there are already these sure. institutions or these national organizations that can serve as vehicles to disseminate this. Thank you very much. I, I will be happy to, like I said, to everyone here. Um, and then if there are tweaks that need to be done per state, we can, we can talk to folks about, about doing that. I think we have a question over here. I'm reading a question on behalf of Mr. Rob Morse. Um, it is uh, in response to hearing panelists uh, throughout the day referring to the need to have bilingual uh, poll workers. His question is, what about having uh, poll workers that are fluent in American Sign Language that are qualified and competent to provide that kind of uh, that level of assistance to deaf voters? And a deep concern that many, Rob Mason, sorry, not Rob Morse, uh, and a deep concern that many election boards lack resources to provide materials in American Sign Language for deaf signing voters. Um, very concerned for deaf signing people with limited education, not being familiar with the proxy ballot, provisional ballot, their rights to file a formal complaint if there's any voting irregularities in the process and so forth. So um, welcoming any comments from the panelists with regards to those issues. It, it strikes me there's quite a, quite a bit there in that question. I think yeah. there's a, a resource uh, question uh, about using the resources. And then uh, I think we, given the topic of the panel, falling back to that section 208 opportunity for voters, even if there isn't an ASL uh, uh, fluent um, individual at the polling place. So if any of our local election officials want to tackle um, some of the resource challenges, uh, m not just with obviously one type of translation, yeah. but all of them. <clears throat> well, sometimes you have to think outside if you can't get enough workers for the sites, and especially in, in this case. I have a uh, director of my voter services area whose daughter is hearing impaired. So she introduced us to the uh, system where you can use the iPad and contact the translator who then can communicate with the voter. And so we have that at our office uh, all the time, but we also now use uh, iPads <clears throat> in the polling place. And so we've been able to take that technology out as a resource to the poll workers if that's needed. And again, the emphasis in two in Florida is you can bring anybody of your choosing to assist you in voting as well. We do in Massachusetts have an auto mark machine which um, if the impaired needs, they take a ballot, they put it in, they have special either braille or um, headphones that will read the ballot to them um, or um, mark it in, uh, with the braille and mark the ballot. Then they take the ballot and put it into the voting machine. Um, well, thank you for, uh, let me see how we're doing on time here really quick. So uh, we've got a couple more minutes. If someone has any additional questions um, that we can try to answer. Good afternoon. My name is Dawn Gaither, and I'm with the Alliance Francaise. And my question is for Francesca and for Bill. Francesca, congratulations on all of your efforts uh, in terms of uh, bringing our Creole, Haitian, uh, brothers and sisters into the language access um, world of uh, Miami-Dade. Um, I want to know who your stakeholders are, who your partners are, and to what extent is Miami-Dade partnering with Orange County? I'll answer first in that the, uh, I mentioned we're using the, uh, making a Haitian Creole uh, trans, um, composite ballot and Miami-Dade is who we are partnering with to get all those amendments uh, from and also to get the titles for all the different elected officials uh, with them. So there's a lot of collaboration between supervisor of elections and uh, working on that. So that's our, our relationship with Miami-Dade on it at this time. Um, and I can say for me, um, so I gave more so of a case study because when all of this was happening, I was in middle school. 
and um, yeah, in 99, I was just entering high school. And so um, there's definitely a lot of our leaders, um, community leaders. Um, you have Gypsy with Satla, you have um, the Catholic Church, the Archdiocese with um, Archbishop Winsky, um, who was a priest at the church that I grew up in. So you've always had like a very clear group of leaders within the Haitian community that have actively worked on um, pushing forward um, any issues and any complaints and any injustices that we see in our communities and that group of individuals and that group of community organizations are still actively working together on various issues that impact the Haitian community. So um, like I mentioned around like the, the written language part and our concerns around as these ballots get longer and longer and um, people not being able to basically digest all of the information that's being given to them and um, with the polling locations and not having enough of them and the lines getting longer, um, that's why we're having these conversations right now on do we need to record um, this language, um, uh, do we need to record um, Creole for the ballot so that people can actually hear it so that they can get through the ballot without basically feeling intimidated by it because it definitely um, discourages a lot of people when you see how long the ballot is. I mean, that's why we have campaigns around vote by mail um, because um, I definitely, like, I request my ballot, for example, and I encourage a lot of my friends to request a ballot, not because I'm going to turn it in and sign it and mail it in because in Florida we have a lot of issues with signatures, but it's more so that I want to see my ballot before I go to the polls. And so using it as an educational tool um, to be able to know, like, when you go to the polls, this is what I'm actually expecting, because um, in Miami Dade, and I believe it's throughout Florida, like, if we request our vote by mail, I can actually t um, take it to the polling location, they'll rip it up and give me a new one. And so I basically had time to study my ballot before I get there. And so, you know, families come together, churches come together and help people navigate through the ballot. So um, there's definitely a lot of community partners that are coming together. There's definitely a huge um, Haitian um, coalition in Orange County that I can definitely connect you to. Um, in Broward County, um, as Bill mentioned, like voluntarily did um, the Creole uh, addition to their ballot as well, because that's also another area that we have a huge um, Haitian community. So it's definitely not without a lot of community collaboration, a lot of partners coming together to actually figure out how do we navigate our community um, through that process. And to her point, as it's been said many times, is about radio. Radio is so important that partnerships with the radio stations in our community uh, are very uh, key to getting the message out in that community. I saw more hands. Hi, uh, Courtney Mills. I'm actually a former Orange County voter. <laughs> so nice to see a lot of Orange County representation today. Uh, there are quite a few of us in the room that are advocates and often when we're working on potential pieces of legislation, there's a debate around you know, standardized requirement for election administration versus giving some flexibility to the local election officials. And I'm wondering if the current situation, especially in Florida, knowing um, some of the laws are very restrictive, such as where you can have your early voting locations, um, versus having a little bit more flexibility when you have sort of a changing population that's changing very rapidly, or you have a very long ballot this year. Um, if, if this has changed your perspective or informed your perspective at all, and if you could share that with the advocates in the room to help us when we're uh, working on election administration issues. Yeah, I, I, the good example is 2012 was an election disaster in Florida. Because in 2011, the Florida legislature cut early voting in half. Uh, they made restrictions that you couldn't move from one county to the other county without voting a provisional ballot. Uh, so we had a whole lot of issues. But I'll have to say, f for the first time ever in my life, uh, I saw the legislature reverse themselves in 2013. But the message we sent to them was, one size does not fit all. And that's where... Francisca mentioned about the early voting going between 8 to 14 days so that a large county like Miami-Dade and Orange County, we can take advantage of the full uh, process. So I think we're, you've got to work on the legislature because that's the, obviously the end, but the, uh, the mindset should always be to enforce flexibility for the local uh, election uh, jurisdiction uh, on their uh, whatever project it be. Right now, Obviously, Florida is trying to push vote center 
and we're getting total pushback, total pushback, because, you know, face it, Florida is the third largest state. We are the swing state, and we have the highest mobility. And so when you have that, they get very antsy about changing anything, about going to an all-male ballot election or uh, going to vote centers where people can go anywhere. And I can speak to that, too, that in Massachusetts, we do have leeway as to where we're going to set up our early voting. And um, the last time we, the first time we had it, it was very well perceived uh, and it was very busy. So I've made some changes and I'm going to have it in a bigger community center with more parking and more hours. And um, also what was a great um, help were poll pads. So when people came in to check in at early voting, we could use a poll pad. And that just made it easier than going through the whole city um, and, and finding the person. It, it just popped up on the pad. And with that, you could check them off as getting a ballot. And they'd just take the ballot and go vote. It made it a lot easier. Um, I think we're, we're running out of time, um, but I do want to, so we actually have a break. Uh, Y'all will have a 15 minute break. Uh, you'll need to be back here though by before 2.50, which is the start of the next panel. And I know it's tempting to make all those phone calls, check all your emails, and maybe kind of drift in, but you don't want to miss the next panel. We have a real, uh, just a real um, delight um, that we have some folks visiting from Alaska, and you do not want to miss this conversation led by um, Alberto from the Pastor Center. So um, everyone is welcome to go ahead and take a break, but please be back uh, in your seats and ready for the next panel.